Welcome to our Backyard Brothers podcast. Uh, we are ending the or nearing the end of May. And so we got a lot of cool things coming up, especially with basketball and hockey nearing the, uh, the championship series. Uh, in fact, we're going to talk about the uh, Eastern Conference and Western Conference finals today uh, as they're underway. But uh, before we get there, uh, we have a, a particular segment that we're talking about. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced a new angle of these segments, and we're going to be doing a new version of that today. We're going to be taking a particular play from the NBA a few years ago and dissecting it, analyzing it, and, and talking about it. And so that's what we're going to jump into first. Uh, this is my turn, and so I'm going to share my screen and hope it shares the audio. Uh, that, that also share tab audio. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Are you seeing this screen? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to play this one time all the way through with the audio, and uh, then we'll go back to watch it. So. This is a team that's number one in the league in offensive rebound. And Tillman able to uh, corral that one in and kick it out. And he'd have to continue to block them out. Miami's been an excellent rebounding team as well. That's why this is a, a real challenge to go against uh, this great active hungry group on the boards. Here comes Shadow Hero, cross courts it. Morris with one on the shot clock. Hero gets it off. Taylor Hero becomes. Okay. So that was the, the, the whole play. Um, before I turn it over to, to you guys for analysis, I wanted to point out just a couple of things from, from me in particular. So I'm going to go back a couple of, I think this is the beginning, and I'm going to turn off the audio so we don't have to listen to, we, we can only listen to each other. So the first thing I want, you, let's back up a little bit more. Okay. Um, oh, we're going to get a little grainy here, aren't we? That's great. Um, okay. Hopefully. Okay. Um, first thing I want you to notice uh, is we have, uh, th this is, almost everyone is on the perimeter at this point. Uh, there is no one in the paint. Uh, the play here is an off-ball screen. As you can see here, it's between Duncan Robinson and Marcus Morris, this off-ball screen. Uh, and uh, if Jimmy hit him right here, maybe it works. But uh, there's th there's this guy right here standing in the way. He could get it. But and so he comes immediately back for a pick and roll. <clears throat> um, at this point, again, you've got all five guys along the perimeter. This is excellent spacing, uh, essentially taking the entirety of the court. Uh, what I can see, there's there's no there's no two guys in two spots, or in in one particular spot. Everyone is is spaced really well, uh, and this is the mistake that they that the Grizzlies defense makes. John Morant tried for the steal out here. Uh, he he tried to get the steal from Robinson, and this leaves Robinson this open lane into the middle. And then this is the fascinating part to me. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you guys right right now because this is where I wanted to stop for a second. Uh, what uh, you see, what that defense is doing, <laughs> all five guys, all five of them are focused in on Duncan Robinson. Not a single one on anybody else. Uh, <clears throat> and he's going into the lane. That, that's why he's closest to the basket. He has the ball, but all five guys are looking his way or trying to collapse into him. And that's leave. It's going to leave four guys wide open on the perimeter, all four of them for a second. I really love the Grizzlies defense too. This is something that we have to talk about how quickly they, they get back on their guys, but everything that's set up with John Morant there leaves them in a wild goose chase, essentially the rest of this entire play, because this ball moves so quickly from player to player. Uh, the ball is always going to be faster than a man. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to you guys before I uh, move on with the play. If you want me to back up, if you want to talk about anything you've seen so far, uh, what, what do you see with this play or, or, or at this moment right now? I better turn my camera. So, just, so I think, the the double screen maneuver there is what really opened 55 up to get that to get that lane and they didn't hesitate at all to pop either screen off they were both super effective not necessarily with catching the guy up uh but with creating kind of that hiccup in the defense in the switches uh so they weren't able to 
to switch effectively, leaving 55 there that lane on the second go round. So the first the first screen really wasn't effective, but didn't need to be because it was a leader for the second screen, uh, in my opinion. And uh, to the credit, like you were saying, to the credit of the Grizzlies defense, uh, that is you're supposed to collapse on the ball like that, but not with the entire team. Uh, and I would say if you left our, I guess that's the three guy right there that's moving down. If you you look at the guy on the top of the perimeter, go to the left, that guy, if he would have stuck on his man, that's nearly perfect defense. For, those yeah, two, I, for them to collapse like that is right if they left the top guy up top. I agree. Yeah, Dustin, Cody? Yeah, with with that comment specifically, yeah, they the defense the way it's collapsing, um, the the guy on the right block should have stayed a little farther out because of Duncan Robinson's pass lane perfectly to the corner, which we know he's going to take. He cannot pass it very well to the left corner because of the way his body's angled, and so that would give the defense better time to adjust. And so a slight overreaction on the defense. But then offensively, it's beautiful. And, and echoing a little bit of what Yancey said is they had that first screen and it was like, okay, if that opportunity's there, great. It wasn't quite there. They immediately went into play, into the second play. They knew immediately what to do. And mm-hmm. every single person on the, yeah, watch this again, how immediately he comes back, boom. He actually shoved him into the screen to reset. I didn't notice that the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And then Butler immediately notices again the opportunity right there. And I love how mm-hmm. as soon as Robinson gets the ball, the the everybody else gets back to the perimeter yeah. because they all spread that defense out. Immediately goes back to the perimeter, and then immediately spaces out from each other as well, in order to create greater space between your man and and where the ball is going to be. It, it, it was it's really beautiful. And I, I, when I first watched this, I thought of the original triangle offense. This has evolved into the star offense that you have basically a star or whatever it is that's always flexing and moving in order to keep space between each other. Shout out Terrence Howard, Tetrahedrons. <laughs> <laughs> Tetrahedrons. Um. Yeah, and we're, we're going to continue watching this play, but we're, we're a little bit further in, and what Duncan Robinson has done, you saw what Dustin said, he, the, the corner lane was open to give to P.J. Tucker. Watch how quickly he immediately passes his ball out to uh, Tyler Hero here. It is a touch pass of the up umpteenth seconds. And look how, hold on, sorry. Oh. Look how yeah. four Grizzlies are below the restricted line. All four of them? Are, are are within like five feet of the baseline. They all mm-hmm. collapse so heavily. They, have, they only have one guy guarding three people up top, two people up top. Yeah. All four uh, of them down low. It, it all started, and, and I'm going to back up to just a little bit as well, back to the John Morant attempted steal here is the one, this thing that kind of throws everything off. You're going to see him try to take this steal here uh, from Duncan Robinson right there. Uh, he tries to take that steal from him uh, as he's passing it, and now he's out of position. Uh, and so Duncan Robinson goes straight to the to the paint here, and that makes everyone have to scramble. But they probably scramble way too much too. They panic essentially, because uh, like Dustin said, uh, you got these guys all collapsing immediately on Robinson. The pass lane is open here and Tucker immediately passes it out. But now all three guys are on Tucker and you got a wide open hero and a wide open Butler over here. Look at um, how wonderfully Morant switched. As soon as he lost his man, mm-hmm. yeah. he booked it to the corner to guard somebody else. They had an immediate switch. He knew what to do. So I know this is Let's fantastic offense, but defense adjusted fairly well. No, I think it's great defense too, uh, except for the fact that they're on a wild goose chase at this point because the ball is moving so quickly. If at any point that ball sticks, if they decide, oh, I'm going to take this guy one on one, that plays over. Yeah, they can uh, reflex, they can reshape the defense and not be as out of position as they are right now. And I agree. That's a good assessment. I think uh, also we have to credit the offense. 
55, that's a super unselfish pass. And then the corner guy doesn't even – he's there's no shot thought in his head. He basically volleyball passes the ball right over to the next guy uh, and just, like you were saying, just quick touch, uh, super unselfish basketball and draining it, taking it down to the last second before you're looking for the shot. Making oh, sure guys. everyone touches it. Go ahead, Cody. Sorry, I was gonna say that was honestly one of my my thoughts right there is he could he honestly could have gone for, the, for that basket and probably would have made it, um, but instead you know he's like you know I'm gonna give ourselves a better shot a better chance maybe even get a three here so I'm gonna toss it out because he's wide open on the corner, um, and so you know his idea what I'm thinking is I could get a shot here, but my teammates open and we're gonna get a better shot later on and so uh, very un, very unselfish um, teamwork yeah, yeah. artistry honestly. All five guys in the Heat will touch this ball during this possession. Uh, and so I'm going to play to Hero here and how quickly they adjust. Now they have two guys on him. And so Hero's their best shooter, and they know, they know this. And so they're coming out on him. Uh, and so he they, ha- they force him to reset. He wanted that shot. But uh, still, the Grizzlies are out of position here. Uh, and so uh, now he's going... I think he hits Robinson, right? I think so. I believe uh, that's where it's going. It looks like it's going to go over Butler. Yeah. Uh, he throws it over here to Robinson, who's almost going to immediately pass it over to, to Morris. And so it's the same play, the same idea that happened on this other side, too. Yeah, the mirror flip. They just kind of mirror yeah. flip the exact same play after the double screen. Uh, and so, again, I have to credit the defense that they're really adjusting really well on this, even though, again, they're they're out of position every single time, but they're recovering really well. Uh, this is the this is what finally does it here when Morris decides to challenge. I wish I knew who this was. I don't know who this is, but might be Tyus uh, Jones. I can't tell. But. OK, yeah. Uh, but he he decides that uh, now that two here tried to take this, he's out of the play. He shouldn't have tried to tried to block this play. He's out now. Now you got five on four. Uh, and so now this guy is stuck guarding Hero and Morris at the same time. Uh, he can't guard both, especially if Hero stays right where he is. If Hero tries to go to the basket, suddenly you got one guy that, that can easily guard two guys. Uh, and so uh, that's what uh, Hero is trying to do. Uh, and so he's going to attack him and force him to make a decision. And that's exactly what he does. And now you have a wide open shot from Tyler Hero because he challenged him. Hero stayed where he was to keep that spacing. And now Hero has this wide open shot. Anything else, guys? Yeah, beautiful play. You said all five players touched it. Guess how many dribbled? Three. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, that, that's beautiful basketball. I remember it reminds me. Uh, Clay Thompson a few years ago scored 37 points on 11 dribbles. Yeah, he almost That's never crazy. dribbled the ball. I mean, and it, it's just incredible things like that that happen. And so it, it's really good basketball. Um, on the defensive side, they did great. That player that I, I thought might have been Tyus Jones, I'm not sure who it was that collapsed there. It was that short-sighted little panic moment where he should have trusted that he had defenders behind him and stayed out, but instead he collapsed because because of that reaction um then it caused that wide open shot but this was this was fantastic offense the defense reacted well but they also were chasing each other around and doing constant switches and so this is this is beautiful offense and the way that it's really meant to be ran in today's nba and that's the that's the thing about it though as well is is this this play is designed to be successful against the best defenses and this this defense playing really well, adjusting very well, still couldn't do it because I mean, it, it mixes them up. It's it's hard to do it, um, and and that's what's so I guess valuable about not. I guess I'm going to make a pun here, but not playing hero ball. And yeah, they got hero the ball anyway. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, it, it's that's the idea of like we are a team. We're not just going to give it to you know the version of their. Or James Harden or whatever on their team, but rather like, hey, we're, we're only working as, as a team. We're going to get this good defense off balance to get that one good shot. Ended up being a three for them. Yeah. Uh, a couple sure. things that I, uh, sorry, Yancy, I'll give you a second. To, uh, I 
A um, couple of things that I wanted to call out, uh, and I wanted to emphasize what Dustin said about Clay Thompson because it sounded like, uh, uh, for those who think he dribbled the ball like eleven, like the ball hit the ground eleven times. That's that's what we're talking about. Like, uh, not 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 that he took eleven drives or he took eleven times to dribble, but the ball hit the ground eleven times total in that game for from Clay Thompson. So, uh, but going back to to this. Um, it this this is unfortunately in the NBA today, and we see it every game in in the playoffs. There's a star who's going to try to go one one on one every time. Uh, uh, sometime in the game, Jamal Murray is going to try to take a guy off the block, or Jason Tatum, or or whatever. And sometimes that's the play. You get your best player the ball, and you trust that he's going to score. Sometimes that's a play. Uh, but Jimmy Butler is a star. He was the star of this this Heat team at this time, uh, and this was the true selfless basketball. Someone said that about a particular player, but I would call out all five players were selfless on this on this play because they all set set this play up to succeed. They didn't care who was going to get the open shot, just that they got an open shot. Um, and uh, that's that's the way that this is supposed to be run in the NBA. And as you can see, uh, if you remember from previous years of, of basketball back in the nineties the, the or so, it was all about attacking the rim. <laughs> uh, it was all about sending all five guys to the rim. Like it offended you. Uh, and th the game is different today. It's not about that. You saw four guys outside one guy in, and sometimes all five out depending on, on the play, depending on the, the situation. Uh, and today uh, you, as an NBA player, if you're coming in the NBA, you better be able to make the three point shot. Uh, because that's that's the way the NBA is set up now. Uh, we talked about Zach Eady for Purdue, who's not going to succeed so much in the NBA because the, a big skill is no longer going to be his when the NBA requires you to make three-point shots at this point. But uh, I think it's important to mention all those things. And, and yes, you, you were going to say something before I, I jumped in. Yeah, uh, I was just going to mention a fun fact while we were talking about dribbling. In the, uh, in the original sport of basketball, the, the ball had laces and you didn't dribble, actually. So that's really just going back back to the olden times, ye olden times of basketball. Uh, and I didn't know if other people knew that, if that would be a fun fact to interject. Uh, but it was something that I found out recently from a guy being shown a ball from the Museum of Basketball or something like that. Yeah, that's a good comment. I didn't know that, actually. So, yeah. Uh, any other comments about this play or this memory or anything else? I think we covered it pretty good. <laughs> Great segment. Great. Okay, let's jump over to the NBA since I'm already showing my screen. Uh, oops, I, I actually we'll we'll talk we'll cover that in a second, but I forgot that we're uh, we're jumping over here first because we're reviewing the semifinals that we didn't cover last week. We're we covered one. What are you seeing? Uh, oh, video. Oh, I have to, I have to stop sharing and reshare. Okay, how about now? There we are. <laughs> okay, so the semifinal rounds. There's three of them that we didn't cover last week. Uh, this was the first one that we'll talk about. Uh, this game went seven, like like Yancey and I predicted, although the other team won. Uh, but uh, this was a weird series because the home team only won two out of seven games in the series. <laughs> that, that that shouldn't happen usually. It's home home court advantage for a reason. But the home team went two and five in the series, uh, and so it, it's it's a weird one. It's, and it's also the the Timberwolves won the first two games and the last two games, and the Nuggets won the three in the middle. That's also just a weird way that that things happen. But uh, um, what 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 happened in the series? And obviously, it was an epic seven game series between. I, I mean, I, I I don't want to discount the Mavericks, but most likely the winner of the series was going to the NBA Finals. But uh, so, what do you what do you guys think about the series? Uh, I I was uh, I was really just kind of upset to watch the nuggets fall apart the way they did uh it was it was kind of weird it was exciting uh in game seven to watch how uh 
the Tampa Wolves made history. They overcame the the largest deficit in Game Seven history to to beat the Nuggets. That was cool, <clears throat> but uh, it was I don't. It was like Jokic was thinking of horses the whole time. I don't know what <laughs> happened to him. He he must have been at halftime. Must have lost a race or something because uh, he came back and the the entire Nuggets team fell apart offensively from halftime on, in my opinion. And I don't know that there's any evidence to to go against that. Like, what were the numbers, Dustin? You texted us and told us what they crazy. what they scored at halftime. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, they they only scored like 37 points or something in the second half. It was. At halftime, it was like they had 57 and ended up with 90, you know, something like that. Yeah, it's like they sent a high school team in their stead in the middle of the game. It was weird watching it um, because it was just a complete all-around breakdown. That's what I saw. That was my opinion of the game. Uh, Game six, not – I mean, they they just didn't show up in game six at all. throughout the game and Ant-Man was going nuts. Uh, and I think that's, that was my assessment. They just kind of broke down after game five and didn't show back up. Yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, to, to piggyback off of what went wrong with the nuggets, I think Mike Malone lost a little bit of trust in his team after that game six loss, because he, he didn't play his role players very much. Um, in game seven. In fact, I think Jokic played 47 out of 48 minutes. And I think that he really just got tired and ragged down and he was taking a lot of contact. Um, and I, I just think that he kind of just lost his energy uh, in, in the fourth quarter uh, because he wasn't getting his rest. And then there was, there was less ball movement for the Nuggets and less role players uh, playing less minutes um, as a result. And they just it just Mike Malone lost a little bit of trust in the team. But then to give great credit to the Timberwolves, they did fantastic in the second half, obviously with that huge comeback. Um, they played so much more aggressive on defense. In fact, in both the third and the fourth quarter, they were in the bonus by like seven or eight minutes, you know, left in the mm-hmm. quarter. Um, and so they were super aggressive getting getting fouled and getting in the bonus early to help that. And that was great for them. Um, and then defensively, they made a fantastic change in putting Nas Reed on Jokic. And, and Nas Reed, like, he, you don't quite shut the MVP down, but he really limited him. Um, combined with his tiredness level, Nas Reed was a fantastic defender and really bothered Jokic. And that really slowed down the Nuggets team and, and uh, Timberwolves were able to take advantage. I think the only thing I needed to add really is basically what you just said, Dustin, is why the bench is so important. You know, everyone on the bench uh, needs to be, needs to have the star like potential. They need to be able to step in and play really good because you can't play your stars the entire time. You just can't do it. Um, and you run out of energy. You can't play the way you need to. Um, and you got to make sure that everyone, everyone on your team, um, is ready, ready and able to play and execute it the exact same way that your starters are. Yeah, yeah to piggyback off that, sorry to interrupt, but uh, <clears throat> Ant-Man did not have a very good game offensively, but looked at how how much Carl Anthony Towns stepped up and played in a way he hasn't played much, and then Nas Reed again. I mentioned him again, but six man of the year, he absolutely proved it. He stepped up and 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 pride so many points and so many intangibles in that fourth quarter jade mcdaniels in game six and seven was that was really good too uh two things that i wanted to mention to close it out you mentioned the bench scoring the nuggets scored two points from the bench the entire game seven and it came from christian brown at the free throw line (laughs) they never made a shot no shot making from the bench in game seven um and the other thing, look at the scores from the when the Timberwolves won. The Nuggets never scored 100 points in the in those losses. In none of in any of those. Uh, that's excellent, excellent defense. In fact, the Timberwolves held the Nuggets to their two lowest scores of the season in the this first 80 and then 70. Uh, the two lowest scores of the whole season came against the Timberwolves in these in these playoffs. So, 
Okay, uh, on to the other semifinal game in the East, uh, the Pacers and Knicks. This one was a fun series, uh, also went seven games. <clears throat> and uh, as Rick Carlisle, the Pacers coach, said in, in the post game, when you win a game seven on the road at the Madison Square Garden, you've made history. Uh, and so that's what the Pacers did. They went into New York, into Madison Square Garden, and won. Uh, and so Pacers win the series. Uh, all, uh, three of us were right. Cody was right about it going seven, but had the wrong team there. But uh, uh, so a lot of things to talk about. But the big one in my eyes were the Knicks just literally ran out of players. <laughs> uh, they, <laughs> I think all five starters were injured by the end of the game. And uh, a couple of bench players, Jalen Brunson breaks his hand in the second quarter and can't play the rest of the game. Uh and all the other Dante DiVincenzo was the only one playing and he played really well in that game. But uh, other than that, just, they ran out of players. So, yeah. Tom Thibodeau called me and asked me if I could play. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell him you were busy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Not so, for the Knicks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what's also incredible is, the Pacers shot like 60% in this game, maybe even higher than that. It's like that they just, the, the hoop was as wide as a, just super wide. Um, I think it was that. 70. I think it was almost 70%. Yeah. They yeah. just, and, and some of it came from their offense, you know, with, they had, they had a lot of good turnovers, um, a lot of good space pace. They played their offense really well, but then they just had shots falling. I, I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, first thing I want to say is the Patriots beat the Knicks last game by 21 points. That's that's crazy. <laughs> um, probably because they have no one injured and Dustin wasn't willing to play. So um, I think my, my thought right now is I would love to – and maybe we'll get this, but I would love to see a Timberwolves-Pacers game. Because we're talking about really good defense against what looks like extremely good offense. I mean, 120, 130 points is the average – what it looks like um this is i mean the pacers are just they look unstoppable i don't know very well i mean both dustin scott yancey know better than me but um the yancey they're the the, the yanceys there you go the um the pacers seem it seem unstoppable the yanceys are also unstoppable i just (laughs) want to point that out he did not misspeak that's what he meant to say he was correct the knicks did choke i did think that would happen uh, and it's that's all I got to add. Thanks for thanks for letting me roll there. <laughs> the uh, Mavericks and Thunder. We didn't cover this one either last week. So uh, uh, the Mavericks won Game Five in Oklahoma City, and then won Game Six by one point in Dallas to close out that series and send the Mavericks to the East to the Western Conference Finals. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about it last week, but just about the Thunder's inexperience. Their, their youth really came back to bite them uh, in this series. But uh, again, they're the youngest team in the league, and they were the number one seed in the Western Conference. They'll be there for a while, I think. So, yeah, um, I'm not worried. I, I'm not too worried about the future of the Thunder. I think that they got a good owner and a good GM that'll keep together continue to build it and i think they have like two top 15 picks in this draft you know they they're going to continue to build um but with this series and specifically yeah specifically the series and game five and six is you know coach coach dagnall like he really tried to play the right kind of offense that got them to the number one seed which is the same kind of offense that we just um we just dissected earlier and shots were just not falling. They just it was just bad luck for the Thunder a lot. And so then he changed his strategy, which was, all right, SGA, go show us that you should have won MVP and just go try to win these games by yourself. And it just it just doesn't work against um, against a defense as stout as as Dallas has. Um, and and so all credit to Dallas for knowing how to shut them down and and force SGA to be you know, to score 40 points a game in order to win. And so all the credit to Dallas, they played fantastic defense. I think the only thing I want to add <clears throat> to that is, you know, uh, Thunder needs to hold their heads up. They got far with the young team. They did really well. Um, and they met a pretty good team with the Mavericks, good coaching. You know, the 
one of the best players uh, in the league. Hold your heads up. Like you said, Scott, they're going to be here for a while. He'll be back. Yeah, I agree. Most of the assessments overall, since they're out of the playoffs, I'll leave the giddy jokes out of it. Uh, the I think the Mavericks were an overall better team, well-coached, more experience is what did this. I don't, I don't really see them moving forward too much further, though. Uh, I'd just like to point out that I was perfectly right here. Uh, mm-hmm. Mavericks and six. <laughs> uh, we we already we covered this one last week, so we don't have to cover it right now. But we will cover the two uh, conference finals. This game last night uh, was fun. It was so bad. <laughs> so we'll get to that in a second. But let's look at some of the reasons here. So I want to show a couple things. Pacers are number two in offense. The Celtics uh, are. I don't think I actually have it here, but they're number one in offensive rating, actually. So you got the number two offense against our number one offense in in this uh, Eastern in this Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, that is uh, pretty fun when you have the two best offenses play, going up against each other, and it really uh, th- these are the playoff averages here. And so uh, Tatum, Brown, Holiday, White. Uh, I left off Kristaps Porzingis. He should be back. They say by about game four. Uh, but uh, he really helps in the paint uh, over here with the the Pacers. Uh, Pascal Siakam, Tyrese Halliburton are really good, having good contributions from Miles Turner and Andrew Nemhard. Yeah. Anyway, the game last night, you can see the offense really showed up. <laughs> Both teams over 120 points. Um, it went into overtime, and not only that, but Jay, but it, the Pacers, I think, were at about 98% chance to win that game. Uh, in regulation, and they turned it over in an inbounds pass uh, with about 10 seconds to go, uh, giving the Celtics the ball, and Jalen Brown hit a ridiculous three uh, over Pascal Siakam from the corner to tie it up and send it to overtime, where the Celtics then won the game. So as the Pacers, you've got to feel like you let that one slip away. The Pacers should have won that game in the in in almost all percentages wise, but the, the I think they had almost 20 turnovers in that game. The Pacers did, and that's that, that's part of why the Celtics were in it. Uh, for whatever reason, the Celtics have struggled at home in the playoffs. They've they've won every road road game. They're undefeated on the road in the playoffs, but they've lost two of them at home, and they almost lost last night. But they still won. They're up one nothing in the series, as you can see. All four of us have predicted a Celtics win. Um, but even before last night, um, I I, I want to say that this, I don't think this is going to be an easy series for the Celtics. This is a tough Pacers team. They might have the deepest bench of any team in the league. Uh, they, they are really deep uh, and they're really fast. Uh, they're And they're just really good offensively. It's going to be a tough series for Boston. I still think they're going to win, but it's not going to be the five game series I that 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 it has been the last two times in my opinion. I disagree. <laughs> Faces will get one and that's it. <laughs> Any uh reasons you want to share with us? Yeah, I think so uh we're we're upping the fact that they're both really good offensive teams, but I think Defensively, Boston's better than Indiana is going to have the chance to be. Um, And that's just because they're young in the paint, in my opinion. They're not like, there's no one super beefy down there or really experienced. Um, And with Port Zingas, Boston does have that in both. Um, Without him, though, there's less, but it's still. I think they still have a better defense than Indiana overall, which is why I picked them in five. And I think that's going to end up showing out because twenty-two turnovers is a lot. That's significant, and if you can force them to make those kind of mistakes again and limit yours to to less than eighteen that they had, uh, you see that win increase go up quite a bit. I think that's what that's what made me pick that. Dustin, you're our you're our genius. Am I am I basketball smart or basketball stupid? <laughs> it's pretty smart because the Pacers once again shot like 60, 65 percent. They shot really well. Um, and statistically that has to drop down. You know, right. uh, 
you can't expect them to continue to shoot in this, make two out of three shots every single time. It's just not statistically uh, sustainable. Um, so I think they will drop down, but it's will the Celtics also drop down because they also played really good offense. So this was two offensive teams meeting together, and the defense that was played was like almost accidental defense where the offense had – bad turnovers, you know, bad loose balls, and defense just happened to be there to get them. And there wasn't a whole lot of forced live ball turnovers. Um, and so, yeah, the Celtics have to clean up defense a little bit and hope for a statistical drop-off. And if they do, then, yeah, they can absolutely win, you know, three out of the next four. Um, but having said that, the, the Pacers have – kept a high percentage and a high offensive rating for, you know, a hundred games going now. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's hard to put them off of that rhythm that they're currently in, especially coming off of that game seven high. Um, I still think that this will probably go six games. I do think Celtics are still going to win, but Pacers watching that game last night was really exciting that this could be a very close series. I don't think I have anything to add. On to the Western Conference Finals. Game one is going on right now. What's the score? Uh, 57-52, Minnesota's up. Okay, that's game one. So uh, uh, here, Minnesota's the best defense in the league. They've they've proved that in their first two series uh, with the sweep over the Suns and the seven-game series win over the Nuggets. Uh, <clears throat> so in the season series, Minnesota won three out of the four games against Dallas. Um, the only one that they lost was a close win in Dallas. And so uh, that's that's something to keep your eyes on. Uh, again, Anthony Edwards has been playing out of his mind. Carl Anthony Towns is right behind him. Uh, and then Rudy Gobert, Mike Conley. Over here, it's Luke and Kyrie. And then uh, P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford are the two big guys. Although Washington shoots really good from three as well. So uh, again, all three of us picked... Minnesota and three out of the four of us picked it to go the length of the series, go seven games. Uh, Dustin was the only one that thought it'd be a little less than that, but uh, uh, we we all agree that the Minnesota is probably going to win this the series. But uh, Dallas has has proven a lot of things in these playoffs. I don't think, uh, obviously, most of us think it's going to go at least. All of us think it's going to go at least six games, and so it's going to be a tough series still. But what do we want to talk about here? So this is a this is the team, the Dallas team, that unfortunately plays well into Minnesota's defensive strategy because their two bigs can't shoot. Um, and so Gobert can just play zone down there in the paint basically all game long. Um, he doesn't have to worry about – he can always be in drop coverage. Um, he doesn't have to worry about going out to the perimeter. Um, and that that plays well to Minnesota's defensive strategy because uh, it'll keep Gobert in the game. And and when he's down in the paint, uh, the team's offensive rating just absolutely plummets. That's why he's won four defensive players in the row in the in, 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 so far in his career is because when he is at the rim, total offensive drop off for the other team. It's it's incredible statistically. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how Dallas will try to play small ball, play around the perimeter a little bit more to try to take Gobert out of the game, either by sitting him on the bench or making him a perimeter defender. Um, I'll be interested to see how they do that throughout the series. Um, so that's why I think Minnesota won that. But the only other comment I have here is it's incredible that we're talking about the two best, the four best teams left. We have a one seed, but then we have a six seed, a three seed, and a five seed. And I think that that just shows the parity that currently exists in the NBA, that the, the super team era that we're so worried about five to 10 years ago is, is, is dead. Um, that like, sure, there's there's lots of great players on great teams but the super team era is dead in any single team. Doesn't matter what your record is. You, if you play well, you can make it deep in the playoffs and get to the finals. Uh, and I'd I also like to point out that uh, unlike Dallas, who's uh, who brought Kyrie Irving over and, and things like that, most of these other teams, the other and, and Indiana brought over Pascal Siakam and Tyrese Halliburton too. But Minnesota and Boston are both homegrown super teams. Uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, they, they, they didn't they didn't trade for people. They didn't sign guys. Uh, they drafted the guys that are their their big players. Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns were both number one overall picks by Minnesota. Uh, Rudy Gobert, I guess, was a was a trade with Utah. But uh, other than that, most of those players from those two teams are homegrown super teams. So that's that's a pretty cool thing too. Uh, shout out to Anthony Edwards and uh, who was that? Who's that big goopy guy that was next to him, Townsend, uh, for being hilarious in that press conference? How yes. much y'all want us to lose? Damn, like we <laughs> lost last year. Like we're trying to win. I thought that was hilarious and just a like a funny kind of personal spotlight on them of like. Yep, we're, you know, we're not trying to lose, right? Like, we want to win. And I just thought that was really kind of a giggle moment that they got out of me. And it was just funny to watch those two joke with each other and the reporters. Uh, and their rapport was just felt genuine and kind of cool. Yeah, I liked watching that as well. Yeah, Town said, Town said, I've been here for nine years. I've lost for nine years. How much more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and then Anthony had- and Edward said something to that. He says, fuck nine years. Because I yeah. want to win. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. I, I think really the only thing I have is more of a question, really. But when's the last time Minnesota been like won the finals? Or have they ever won the finals? Yeah. They've never been to one. They've never been to the finals. They were last here in 2004 with MVP Kevin Garnett. That's the last time they've been to the conference finals. But no, they've never been to an NBA finals and definitely never won one. Okay. Well, then I can probably speak for most people that um, that I'm a, I'm a Wolves fan the rest of the way then. Well, yeah. let's, let's say this too. Indiana has not been to a final since the year 2000. So uh, it's been a long time for the Pacers as well. Uh, actually, actually, all four of these teams, it's been a while for all four of these teams since they won a finals. Dallas last won in 2011. The, Pace, the Celtics last won in 2008. Um, so been a long yeah. time for all four of these teams. Does anybody hey. else feel old saying that the year 2000 was a long time ago? <laughs> yeah, yep. long time ago. But yeah, um, Timberwolves and Pacers have never won, um, but they mm-hmm. could face off, right? And you get a winner uh, there. But yeah, it'd be interesting to, to see how it all plays out. I love, you know, you see NBA news updates memes whatever it is that no matter who wins it it, people are getting new championships right there's all stars players that are absolutely at the center of the nba right now who all have zero championships and so somebody's walking away with their first and that's a great that's a great thing that somebody's going to get it this year whether that's jason tatum or anthony edwards or luka Doncic or tyrese halliburton somebody's getting it it's great So, uh, go ahead, Yancy. Do you guys, uh, just personally, the East has been getting usually the, the Celtics just choke, right? And they don't, they can't keep going. Do you think that happens again this year? Or have they finally pieced it together? Because that's a solid record this year. I just wanted to get like the overall assessment on do they do, do, they do it again or are they going to follow through this time? My prediction, and let you guys can do it too. I, I, like I've said, the Celtics will make it to the NBA Finals. I think they're beating the Pacers in the series. Uh, that that's one hump that they haven't got over very often in the last decade. But uh, um, I would expect that they'd be the favorite to beat Minnesota as well. But the Timberwolves offer a big challenge for the Celtics, um, and so I think if if Dallas beats Minnesota, then the Celtics will win the NBA Finals. They'll beat Dallas, but if they face Minnesota, it's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a good series if those two go up. Yeah, just thinking of last year, um, Denver against Miami, it felt overpowered. You know, Miami yeah. played so well, but then it was just overpowered. I I don't see either of these four teams. There's absolutely none of that. Minnesota feels a little bit overpowered, but look at what Dallas did to OKC. You know, and they're they're in this game, you know, down by five or six at halftime um, and they're doing it offensively. Um, so this this is this is absolutely what basketball is meant to be, that you have a three seed, a five seed, a six seed, a one seed, all playing fantastic basketball, competing well together. 
and there's overtime games where it, it doesn't seem clear. You know, it's easy to look at records and say, oh, wow, they're so much better than this by record, but it's the reason we play. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're we're going to hit a couple of quick topics, uh, you know, two, three minutes each here. Uh, but uh, let's start with the WNBA season. It got started uh, this week, last week, I think, maybe last week. Uh, and so uh, right now, three undefeated teams so far, New York Liberty, Connecticut Sun, and Minnesota Lynx are still undefeated, while the Washington Mystics and Indiana Fever, with our number one overall pick, Caitlin Clark, have yet to win a game, 0-4. So uh, let's uh, – anything you guys want to mention from the WNBA, uh, it's important to keep it in our minds that, uh, hey, there's this other league of really, really good professional basketball players that we need to keep our eyes on. So – yeah, I, I think, you know, contrary to some weird expectations, the season for Indiana Fever is going about as expected. Um, you know, the, the, you can't take one player and totally transform a team. Um, and so, like, I expect them to win some, but it, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it's going about as expected. I would also say that the season for the New York Liberty is also going as expected. That's a fantastic team. Yeah, I think um, and I, I think I really have to go off off of what I based off of what I've heard as well. But that Caitlin Clark is is actually playing not very well. That's what I've heard. I don't know if that's true. Um, but obviously the team's not 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 doing too well. But I have heard that Angel Reese. I don't know what team she's on, but I've heard she's been playing extremely well, phenomenal. Uh, which is uh, which is I guess an interesting dichotomy. Is that the word I want to use? Maybe a dichotomy. Um, that there is almost like a, that rivalry in college, if you will. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, and now they're in pros. Caitlin Clark isn't, at least to some expectations, isn't playing what they thought that she would uh, while Angel Reese is. Caitlin Clark's stats so far for the, for the first four games, 14.5 points per game, uh, shooting 30% from the floor and 27% from three. Uh, really... Obviously, compared to her season at Iowa, which was out of this world, she's certainly crashed back to earth for the first four games. So, yeah, the the comparison I would make is I think it was oh 2013. Uh, the Philadelphia 76ers had a terrible season, won like 11 games the entire season, and all while the Kentucky Wildcats, with like you know, went undefeated and won the national championship, and people asked. John Calipari says, hey, do you think that uh, the Kentucky Wildcats could go and beat Philadelphia 76ers? And he said, if we played them 100 times, they would wipe the floor with us 100 times. There's absolutely no comparison between the talent level of a college-level team and an NBA, and a professional-level team in any sport whatsoever. You put, you put Alabama football against you know Carolina Panthers, it, they're going to win by 100 points. Carolina will absolutely wipe the floor every, time, every single time. Uh, there's absolutely no comparison, and to to take a college level star and and put them into a professional league, they've got to adjust. They've got to adapt. Am I the only one that wants to see that now? See the Carolina Panthers just destroy Alabama? <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> I was just going to say Calipari would know. He he's coached in both leagues, and so he, he understands the difference. But yeah, anything else about WNBA before we move on to the next topic, which. I believe, uh, Yancey, take us through Tyson Fury. Yeah, yeah so we have uh, Tyson Fury and Alex Alexander Yusk, I think is how you say his name right. Uh, he's from the Ukraine. They uh, had a boxing match. Uh, Alex Alexander, Alexander, sorry, Yusk was able to edge him out and kind of win the decision. Uh, I believe it was a split decision victory. And watching the highlights and then watching – uh, the fight, he just outperformed him. He had a game plan that he's been working on for, for years, I would assume. Uh, and he executed it beautifully. I wish I had uploaded a clip to you guys or something, uh, so that way we could show it, uh, maybe another time or something. But essentially, he, uh, Tyson Fury does this thing where he shoulder rolls. He hides his chin using his shoulder and turns away from you. Uh, and when you do that, this side of your face is susceptible to being punched if you're not guarding it with a punch or with your other 
with your glove, right? So you, you see that space that's created when I do that? And then if you don't put your hand up, you get caught. And essentially what happened is Tyson is doing this shoulder roll. He eats a hook on the open side, opens up the shoulder, eats a hook on this side, and doesn't really recover from that uh, in the in the last round. He, he didn't knock him out, uh, but it was obvious to everybody that was watching, like, if, if that goes another 30, 45 seconds, he does knock him out. Uh, and it was enough to, to convince the judges that he had done enough to win that fight. Uh, Tyson boxed well, but he didn't look like himself, um, which is unfortunate for me. I'm a huge fan of Tyson Fury. I don't know if you know his, his story, but he took three years off, was suicidal, got up to almost 400 pounds, lost all that weight, came back, and then won a belt. Uh, after uh, beating Deontay Wilder three times. Uh, well, once they had a draw. Uh, but he has an incredible personal story that I suggest everybody go check out of, you know, fighting his way out of depression. He was a world champion before he got sad. So his message is like, you could have everything and still feel like you want to die and you have to fight those feelings and, and become something. Uh, and uh, so... Keep a, keep a, let's keep an eye out for Tyson. Make sure he's still smiling and happy with his family. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that, you know, Yusk was able to unify that. That's a, that's a, a feat that shouldn't be overlooked. It's been 21 years since somebody was able to do that, um, to, to unify all the belts and basically be undisputed champion. Uh, and so he did earn the right to be called that over Tyson Fury. Um, but just, it hurts me as a Tyson Fury fan to, to acknowledge that, but he did do that. And it's an incredible feat that hasn't been accomplished for two decades plus in boxing. So shout out to you for doing that. Yeah. I think I just, I honestly have a question uh, for you, Ancy with, with, uh, I want to say UCF UFC, um, is CTE, uh, I forget what it stands like, chronotelepathy, whatever your brain has holes in it, it stands for. Telepathy. <laughs> Tele yeah, chronic telepathy. I can move things with Anyways, my mind. You guys know what I'm talking about, though. CTE. Is that is yeah, that yeah, much more common in UFC than it is everywhere else? Or what What are they, what, are, what is a sport doing to prevent that? Because that's just what I think of. Generally, when I think of UFC, is people just getting punched in the head so much and developing CT. Got you. So, as a person who played football and a person who has done MMA, I'll tell you that football is far worse from your brain as far as like repetitive, continuous trauma. Uh, if in MMA I hit you and knock you out, and the first punch does it, they don't stand you up, count to ten, and let me hit you again. So it's it's actually safer overall than both boxing and professional football in my opinion maybe the lower levels not so much but in professional football you're having a, a what if you're a ball carrier what amounts to a 30 mile an hour car crash every minute and a half to two minutes now let's add that up to visit what how many times can i physically punch you in a 15 or 25 minute if we're champions 25 minutes if you didn't defend yourself, I couldn't hit you 25% of the amount of time that you're going to receive trauma in a, in a football game, period, point blank, just numbers wise. Uh, and that, that triples if you're talking about linemen, because that's what we're doing every single play is bashing heads. Uh, and then with MMA, the gloves are smaller. So the, 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 it looks worse, the damage, like it'll a laceration. But if you ask a doctor uh, if you should get hit with a razor or a sledgehammer, he'd tell you he'd prefer you to get hit with a razor. He could fix that better. Um, but you're taking padded sledgehammer hits to the head in football versus the trauma event is the end of the fight. And then you have to take six weeks off, and we're not going to allow you to fight again for another six weeks mandatory for your health so it's just a it's a different thing it is safer overall in my opinion uh and having done them both but it's probably not i wouldn't suggest it to anybody trying to avoid head trauma <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate thanks for that, that. analysis Yancy. Yeah, yeah that was great, great.
Thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, two more segments. First of all, I just got to mention that uh, uh, Scotty Scheffler, our Masters champion, uh, was arrested uh, by going into a PGA Tour. Uh, so uh, there, there was a serious event that preceded this. A, a man was hit by a bus or a truck or train or something uh and, and was killed shuttle thank you a shuttle bus he was uh, he was hit and killed by the shuttle bus uh over there at the near the entrance of the pga tournament tournament there and so the, obviously a lot of that was shut down uh to investigate the scene to to clean up and, and all, all those things scotty scheffler uh headed toward uh trying to make his tea time G drives up on the median and goes past the, uh, the 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 accident scene, past the cops, past the ambulance, past the the crime scene. While flaggers and police officers are trying to wave him down, he doesn't care. He just keeps going. And so police drag him out of the car, put him in handcuffs, and arrest him. Uh, and so that made news on Friday, last Friday. Uh, and uh, so just got got to mention that and and Dustin, I'll let you tell the joke that I laughed for like ten minutes about. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, so basically you know Scotty Scheffler assaulting a police officer, getting arrested, bailing himself out of jail, and then still making his tea times about the whitest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> How many racists are mad that this didn't happen to Tiger Woods? <laughs> well, uh, uh, now there's been like three three fantastic golfers who have all been arrested for different things. Scotty Scheffler, Tiger Woods, John Daly. Only one of them you really expect it from. That's John Daly, by the way. Okay? Uh, <laughs> He's the Santa one that's drinking all the time, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. I would so kick it with that guy. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like That would be my best friend. Yeah, he's, he's great. It's no surprise he went to the University of Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's just you'd ever expect, you know, nice, calm, uh, super Christian Scotty Scheffler to to be arrested, you know, and like then just be in this jail cell going, oh gosh, oh darn, what am I going to do? <laughs> I, 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 I get golf today. I guess I, I, you maybe there's more to the story that you guys know that I don't, but. Was he drinking that time? Was he drunk? Or what? What no. is? Why was he doing this? I mean, he he would obviously know was he shouldn't be doing that, right? I, I don't think he understood. I think he thought that it was security uh, because he's he's the most famous golfer in the world. And I think he thought that it was extra security and didn't understand that it was a crime scene. And maybe with a little bit of anxiety on this being the PGA Championship, he he made some bad decisions. No, he was not drinking at six in the morning. He's not John Daly. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to misquote Rick James and saying being white and titled is a hell of a drug. <laughs> yeah. That, 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 that was going to be my, my, my take. I, I hope it's what you said, Dustin. I, I hope it is because the, 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 the other side of it would, is that uh, that doesn't apply to me. I'm better than that. So uh, there, there is that possibility. I hope it's the first one, but there is the possibility that I don't have to follow those because I'm, I'm Scotty F and Scheffler. So. Yeah, I'm on my way to the Masters, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but yeah, yeah. Ho hopefully it wasn't the second thing. I think that it was a, a honest mistake that was carried way too far, uh, based on misunderstandings and stress and. Then a little bit of like, I got it. Do you know who I am? Kind of thing. Yeah. I've but been no, he was not drinking at six in the morning. I've been really? tased for not showing my ID in Pennsylvania. Uh, but I'm still on the side of the cops here. Like, dude, I told you to stop and you just drove through people like, hello, the streets over here. You went on the median. It's almost like, OK, yeah, I was late for the mad. But still, at the end of the day, it's like. Okay, dickhead, people have stuff to do too. I'm not driving over people because I got things that I feel are more important to me than you. So at the end of the day, I feel like either way, it's kind of like take your lumps and move on from it, and you're you're fine in my eyes. But if you try to justify it with like, I was trying to make it to the master, you shut up, bro. Get on somewhere with that. I'm not hearing none of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Scheffler ended up shooting six under that day, and he finished finished the uh, tournament in twelfth place. Right, so not only is it another top twenty finish for him, but you know, a good overall showing. You know, after, after this, and so it's just kind of a funny thing that he still ended up being a top top twenty finisher. Yeah, it's possible to shoot under. <laughs> <laughs> Cody, okay. you're starting to sound like me. We should play golf together. <laughs> so how got, often do you how often do you go overhand? <laughs> you chop down at it, you know? It's chop down. <laughs> we it's got all us. in the wrist. <laughs> we got six minutes and we're gonna try to do a little bit of a of a pardon the interruption segment here where Dustin's gonna be our our mediator here or our uh or introductor at least, and talk about a couple of topics. And this is a five-minute thing, so it's going to be pretty quick. But uh, Dustin, let's uh, let's 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 take these topics and roll with them. Yeah. So a little bit of a part in the interruption, and we'll try to keep it at a, you know a one minute each kind of thing, kind of like the show did. Um, but just just for some fun banter, let's have a have a discussion on some some NFL legacies and NFL topics. Um, Starting off with NFL legacies from two Hall of Famers, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees. Who has the better legacy? And also, and is there any any opinions on who's the better quarterback? Who would you take starting over? Like that. Let's let's go around. Cody, you first. Okay. Um, they they both have great legacies, but the best legacy is Peyton Manning. Uh, they are comparable. They are comparable. Obviously, they're both Hall of Famers. Are great. Um, I would take both, but if I were to take, if I could choose one, it'd be Peyton Manning. I think he has, and I think there's some stats wrong here, but two or three Super Bowls, um, two two Super Bowls, thank you. Tons of Pro Bowls. Uh, Drew Brees, I think, only had one Super Bowl. Um, but well, against who? T- did he have two? No, no, I, against he got it against he beat, Peyton. He beat Peyton. He beat Peyton Manning. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's, that's what, Super Bowl, but his, in a Super Bowl, he beat Peyton Manning in the Super right. Bowl. So uh, lucky he's got he got lucky that time. Man. <laughs> when Peyton Manning threw the interception, <laughs> that ended that that Super Bowl. Yeah, got lucky. He got uh, lucky. The guy who caught him was wearing the same uniform he was. <laughs> um, so so let, let me say this: uh, I, I agree, though, with Cody in the end that that Peyton is. The, is has the better legacy, but there's a lot of things that uh, that come into it. I think Peyton was obviously the most uh, fundamental, or not fundamental, but the most prototypical size quarterback. He had all the 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 uh, natural God given talent that any any quarterback has ever possessed six foot five 240 pounds had the had an arm that could throw at the length of the field. I mean he he could do everything it was all laid laid in for him. Drew Brees is my height. Uh, and he had to fight for every single piece that he had to do. He had an injury that almost ended his career in 2006, uh, and he was able to to come back from that as well. I think Drew Brees has overcome more odds than Peyton Manning has to get where he is today. Uh, and so I think that needs to be said for what Drew Brees has done, is that he's had to fight harder, and he's had to do more to get to the same level that we're even talking about them in the same conversation. Yancey? Uh, hyenas, hyenas have to hunt a lot harder, but lions still get bigger. It's uh, So, and that's my point. Uh, at the end of the day, I think they are, they're comparable quarterbacks. This is a, a tough argument for me because you can put them in the same tier and almost same class of quarterback if it weren't for a couple of differentiating factors for me. One being Peyton Manning's size. If you look at a quarterback, do you think a guy that's 5'10", or do you think a guy that's 6'5"? You think a guy that's 6'5". We don't have to argue about it. Uh, and Breeze was, would give you, or not, uh, he, he would give you things that Peyton wouldn't in the fact that he was faster than a land turtle. Um, and so he could <laughs> scramble and create things. But I could tackle Drew Breeze, not a problem. I'm 6'3". I could tackle Drew Breeze, I promise. I don't guarantee that I could take Peyton just one on one, take Peyton down. He's a he's a larger human. You would think about that, um, but I, I don't think about that with with Breeze. Um, <clears throat> another thing I want to point out: their IQs were similar, but you 
you would when you think of football, high IQ football, you think of two people, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning. Um, and Peyton Manning was a, a very vocal, very intelligent person that had a, a higher ability, a, a better ability to visualize the field than any quarterback I think we saw previous or since. Um, and Peyton also broke his neck before he won his second Super Bowl. I'm going to point that out for adversity. Uh and uh, I think just overall, that's why I would take him is the assets that he collects give you an overall advantage more so than Drew Brees, what Drew Brees can put on the table. All right. To kind of bring this home as, as moderator and also to put my two cents in, I'm, with Peyton Manning's size, I think if you reduce his forehead to normal size, he's closer <laughs> to Drew Brees' size. Oh, where did I, I get that from? I was waiting for the forehead joke. <laughs> I was too, man. That hurt. That was good. That was good. Um, okay. No, I, one I, more. Sorry. Go ahead, Dustin. I, I absolutely love the conversation. I'm on the Drew Brees side. I think that they're both fantastic. But Drew Brees overcoming the odds with his size and being able to have what's I think he holds the best completion percentage um, record that he he put the ball on his receivers better than any other quarterback ever has, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, which is the whole job of the quarterback. All right, do yeah. we have time for one more? One more, yeah. All right, let's make this quick, a quick roundup. There has been there was six quarterbacks drafted in the first round. Of these six, uh, who do we expect in five years from now to be to be the best position, to be the, the best objectively uh, of those six? We can go in the same order. Cody, Scott, Yancey, me. Out of the six taken in the first round this year, I expect Bo Nix to be in the best position. I think Bo Nix is set up most for success. He had the most years of experience in college. He had the most adjustments made from going from an or from a Auburn offense to Oregon offense, um, and being set up with with Sean Payton and with the Broncos, I think is a really good pairing for him so five years from now i expect him to be not only obviously a starter in the league but i expect him to be how are having a few pro bowls under his belt playoff appearances maybe not maybe probably even a championship like an nfc champion or afc championship um game uh, appearance that's my expectation bo nicks um i i would think that bo nicks would be about the same level that he is entering the league now honestly like i think he's gonna be okay but uh the i i would pick two caleb williams <laughs> uh, i think he has the potential to be the best quarterback of this draft class uh and i think he could be but the other one i want to mention is michael Penix jr uh taken by the falcons um i think that he I think he comes into a perfect situation. He's learning under Kirk Cousins. Uh, he's being able to take the, the those those two years where really developing and learning under that system. And so I really like actually that pick a lot uh, by by the Atlanta Falcons and not thrusting him immediately into the, the fray, but letting him learn. If that was if that is the right pick, I think he has the best setup for success later down the line because the Falcons are going to be good. And if he comes in in two years when the contract is up for Kirk Cousins, because it's four years, but only two guaranteed, uh, and they're not going to do longer than that. I think that Penix takes over in three years, and he has the tools to be the best quarterback of that class. Uh, but either him or Caleb Williams, in my mind. So overall, I think that I agree with Cody's assessment the most. I hope that Cody's right the most, seeing as we're getting Bo Nix here in, in Colorado for the Broncos. And, and I wish them success. I hope that that's correct. Um, but I also agree with Scott's assessment and that physically Penix Jr. is the best quarterback that came out of that draft. I don't think it's Caleb Williams. I think his mouth does a lot of that and lip service doesn't do a lot for me. Um, so, I mean, he, he's he's talking to himself as far as I'm concerned. If we're talking about him saying he's great and all that, that doesn't mean anything until you hit the field. Um, and I think that that's going to end up being a bust. And I saw physical talent in Penix Jr. that I think will uh, come to fruition in a way that we didn't see in college in Atlanta because of the supporting cast that he has. And I think that that was a, a, a really good point out from you, Scott, to see that he, he has a greater chance 
uh, for success because of the supporting cast that he has. And I think that's actually my pick is Penix Jr. to be the most successful out of those guys that come out of the draft. Even though I want Bo Nix to be the most successful, I believe that uh, Penix Jr. will have the physical attributes and the team around him to support that success. <clears throat> Good comments. I think I think I agree with some with with most of these. I like the Penix Jr. I agree with that. Bonix, I think that's interesting that there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I would go with uh, May. Is it Drake May in New England? That uh, I, I see in five years a total shift in the NFC East. That that those teams that's are all it. sorry AFC East. I'm sorry. Those teams are all going to have a change over in the next five years. They're at all. They're all going to be sunset in the next five years and the Patriots have an opportunity to to have a growth there and become the leader um, in the AFC East um, and if, if May can develop really well in that system that he can be the leader in the AFC in the AFC East and maybe the AFC that he may be best set up for success five years down the road yeah great great comments and we'll, we'll see if we can continue that going for the uh, rest of our our podcast to the, at the end of our podcast, if we have time for that. So I liked all those comments. Uh, We'll talk uh, next week. Yes. So. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone.